variety of areas. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. So it has uh, applications in a huge variety of areas, and I would say that uh, this is a class which is which uh, is uh, which is geared towards methods in data science and data mining. And I would say that anyone working with data should have a Gromner basis in uh, in their toolkit. Uh, I will not get too technical while describing Gromner basis. I will stick to providing a high level um, uh, intuition. In the end, I will give you references. Anybody interested can always check them out. Uh, while I won't get technic too technical, uh, the talk will involve a lot of math, but it's really very simple mathematics. It's just high school level mathematics. Um, and it, I really don't expect that there should be any problem following it. And But yes, of course, if there are any questions, please, please uh, feel free to stop me um, and ask me questions. So like Vikram said, I do research in uh, algebraic geometry. Specifically, I study uh, topological questions in algebraic geometry. Uh, algebraic geometry deals with polynomials. Everybody knows what polynomials are. And polynomials are nonlinear objects. So I'm calling that out expl explicitly, that polynomials are nonlinear. Uh, you've studied methods such as PCA, um, singular value decomposition, and so on which count as linear algebra. Today, we are going to en enter uh, the non-linear non world, and we're going to see what that can do to, in various applications. Uh, so, uh, why should we so why should we study non-linear algebra? Look, linear algebra is powerful. I mean, there are a lot of efficient algorithmic implementations of uh, uh, linear algebraic methods. But in many real, many real world situations are really non-linear. Uh, using a linear lens, to model such situations can be severely limiting. Uh, that is why when we work with data, we must be able to think non-linearly as well. And now uh, linear, uh, li non-linear methods are obviously more computationally expensive, but because of the power they have, uh, and also given the fact that computational capacity has vastly increased over the years, many non-linear uh, methods are actually are feasible and have found real world applications. Now, so far I've been vague. I haven't told you precisely what algebraic geometry studies, precisely what I mean when I say nonlinear. Let me tell you that. Uh, algebraic geometry studies the zeros of polynomials. Specifically, given a polynomial, what are the points at which the polynomial evaluates to zero? More formally, given a polynomial f, which can be a function of more than one variable, uh, what are the points at which f evaluates to zero? The set, of, uh, the set of points at which f evaluates to zero is denoted by z of f. Uh, that's it. And algebraic geometry basically studies z of f for various polynomials, various different f's. Let us look at examples, lots of examples, in fact. The first polynomial we, we shall look at is x minus 7. At what values of x does this polynomial evalu evaluate to zero? The answer is obviously very easy to figure out. Basically, this polynomial is zero only when x is equal to seven, and it's non-zero for any other value of x. Okay, this was very easy. Uh, let's dial it up a little bit. Consider the polynomial x squared minus three x plus two. What are the zeros of this polynomial? Well, to figure that out, let's do some simple high school algebra. We factor in the moments. And this, this, so this polynomial is equal to x minus one times x minus two. So when is this product zero? Obviously it's zero when x is equal to one or x is equal to two. Our next example looks more complicated, although it really isn't. It's a, gener it's a generic quadratic equation. And again, we've done this in high school. We know the roots of a quadratic equation. It's minus b plus or minus c squared minus four ac by two a. Uh, so the roots are basically the points at which this polynomial evalu evaluates to zero. All right, now we're going to do more examples, lots more. Uh, consider the polynomial y minus x. Now, uh, the examples we already saw had just one variable. At this point, we have two variables. When is this zero? For instance, this is zero when y is five and x is five, obviously, right? This is also zero when y is, five, y is seven and x is seven. So, we see the pattern here very obviously. The, this is zero when uh, the x, x coordinate and the y coordinate is always is the same. 
So uh, if we uh, if we plot the set of zeros of this polynomial in two dimensions, you get a line. This even this was like I said, is high school. I told you it's it's all going to be high school mathematics. Uh, the set of poly, uh, set of zeros of this polynomial is a, is basically a line through the origin. Now uh, here's another simple uh, another similar example. We take the polynomial y minus two x. Uh, the polynomial will have evaluate to zero when the value of y is exactly twice the value of x. So the set of zeros of this polynomial also forms a line through the origin, although it's a line different to the line uh, from from the previous example. Next, let, uh, next, let's look at, a, at the zeros of a polynomial which contains squared terms. So in this polynomial, you have uh, y plus x squared minus 2x. Uh, what are the z minus 2x minus 1? What are the zeros of this polynomial? The zeros no longer form a line because of the squared term. Uh, and this is what the zeros look like. Uh, we'll take another example. Here you have a cubic term. So you have uh, x cubed in this. Polynomial in um, uh, in this polynomial. What do the zeros of this polynomial look like? It's a little more uh, funky than the quadratic k. The zeros are basically looking more and more complicated as we increase uh, the degree of the polynomial. We are not done with that. I'm 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 not showing you. Uh, okay, I'm partly showing uh, you all these examples to showcase my latex skills, but it's really more to drive home the fact that there are many different type of many very crazy zero sets that can occur when you study zeros of polynomials. And algebraic geometry really studies uh, this in full generality. So here we have uh, the polynomial x squared plus y squared minus one. You should recognize this. It's the equation of a circle. Sure enough, the zeros of this polynomial form a circle. And the other one is similar to a circle, but it's actually the equation of an ellipse. Sure enough, the zeros of this polynomial form an ellipse. Uh, I told you that the shapes can get complicated very quickly. Here's an example. In the literature, these are called Cassini ovals. They get dramatically different very quickly. So uh, what we've been, <laughs> we studied very simple stuff so far, but this one actually, I haven't written down the equation. It looks very similar to these kind of things, which are circles and parabola. But as you can see, the zero sets um, are, uh, look very different, look dramatically different. So given all the examples I've shown uh, shown so far, I'm, uh, you're, you should be convinced that algebraic geometry deals with uh, all kinds of uh, complicated geometric shapes. I, uh, I just showed, uh, I just only showed you zeros of polynomials in two variables. If you take polynomials in three variables, you will, you will need three dimensions to uh, plot the zeros. Here's an example in three dimensions of the zero set of a polynomial in three variables. So in summary, here is the description of what can be called the motivating problem in the central problem in algebraic geometry. You're given a set of polynomials, say uh, F1 to Fm. You want to obtain the points at which all of these polynomials simultaneously evaluate to zero. The examples we did contained only one polynomial and we looked at the zeros of this uh, one polynomial in isolation. Uh, in more general uh, situations in algebraic geometry, you will have multiple polynomials and you basically will want to study the common zero set of these polynomials. Of course, uh, this is just equivalent to the intersection of the zero sets of the individual polynomial. Any questions so far? I don't see anything in chat. Sorry. I, I'm sorry. I thought someone was speaking. I hope I didn't speak over there. All right. Uh, yeah. If I see anything in chat, I'll um, I'll respond to it. Anyway, now let uh, let me uh, clarify what I mean when I said uh, when I use the term nonlinear. You've done PCA. Uh, singular value decomposition, et cetera, and they fall under the umbrella of linear algebra. What is linear here? In what, what, what is meant by linear? Well, a function f is linear if f, f of alpha x is alpha times f of x, and alpha here is a constant. Uh, uh, basically, if you want to evaluate f of alpha x, what you can do is you can just compute f of x, 
and multiply the result by alpha. Equations of linear um, functions are given here. Uh, I, I, I mean, we, we've seen examples of uh, linear functions. You can see, uh, uh, sorry, in this, this, this is here, that here we have a few examples, f of x is equal to 7x, that's a linear function, g of x comma y is 15x plus 7y, even that is linear. Uh, so what is the significance of linearity? Uh, for one advantage, one awesome advantage, go back to what I call the main, main motivational question of algebraic geometry. Right? You're given a, a set of polynomials and you want to find their common zero. Now, if the polynomials are linear, right, then that is wonderful because you can solve that system just by using the method of Gaussian elimination. Uh, if you've forgotten, it's okay if you've forgotten what Gaussian elimination is, I'll go over the method. Uh, but yeah, I mean, if you remember it, you know that it, yeah, it's a very simple method and you can solve any system of linear equations using uh, uh, Gaussian elimination, not just solve, very efficiently and it's efficiently programmable. Uh, today, we are going to learn about a generalization of Gaussian elimination called Grobner basis. This is just a very simple tweak of, origin, uh, of ordinary Gaussian elimination. And the wonderful thing is that it, this generalization allows you to solve any system of polynomials. So let's see what Grobner bases are. To uh, understand what Grobner bases are and how to find and use them, let's start with Gaussian elimination. In fact, the simplest form of Gaussian elimination we learned was in fact, once again, in high school. So let's go over that. If you remember, we called it solving simultaneous equations. So this is the case where you have two equations, uh, each uh, two linear equations, each in two variables. Let's go over an, over an example. Here you have um, uh, two equations. You want to find x and y such that both equations are simultaneously satisfied. The equations here are 3x plus y is equal to minus 1, and then 7x plus 11y is 15. How do you solve this? Uh, the first step, first step would be to eliminate the x terms. Now I'm sure everybody knows this. There's a reason why I'm go over, going over this step by step. It really isn't to insult anyone's intelligence. So, um, so here you have this. Uh, the first step is to eliminate the x terms. The first equation has three x as the x term, and the second x, the second equation has seven x as the x term. To eliminate the x term, we multiply the first equation by seven and the second equation by three, and then subtract. Uh, the first equation is multiplied by seven. Seven is in fact the coefficient of the second of, of x in the second equation. And conversely, the uh, second equation is multiplied by three. You get three from the first equation. So there, in some sense, there is an exchange of coefficients. So you carry out these multiplications followed by a subtraction, you get minus 26 y is my equal to minus 52. That is equivalent to saying y is equal to two. And uh, now that you've deduced y, that y is equal to two, you can substitute this into either equation to obtain that x is equal to, uh, you can to obtain x is equal to minus one. Okay? Thus, you have solved the system. Uh, again, this is just to draw attention to the fact that the key step in Gaussian elimination is the elimination of a variable by exchanging coefficients. Uh, after that example, we can very easily describe what Gaussian elimination does in full generality. Given a system of n linear equations in n variables, uh, we eliminate the leading term for every pair of linear equations, just like how we did in the previous case with, the, with two equations and two variables. Here's another example to make things fully clear. We have two equations f and g. The coefficient of x in f is 4. And the coefficient of x in g is 7. To eliminate x, we do 7f minus 4g. So f is multiplied by the coefficient of x in g and vice versa. Again, an exchange of coefficients. We keep doing this um, for every pair of equations until we reach an equation with just one variable. Uh, and then we solve the system with back substitution. So once you have an equation, one variable, you know what that variable must be. And then you can substitute that in an equation with two variables, which has just that and something else. And then so on uh, inductively, you can solve the entire system. 
So this method is powerful and works in all cases where there are linear equations. Can this sort of an idea, can this sort of a method be applied to a system of polynomials? Let's see, let's see if we can do this. So here we have two polynomials, nonlinear, again, remind, just to remind you, the polynomials are x squared y cubed minus four is equal to, uh, and if you wanna look at the points where it's equal to zero, and the other one is x cubed y squared minus two. So just like Gaussian elimination, just like in the Gaussian elimination situation, let's try to eliminate the leading term. Here, however, here, the variables are not the same. In Gaussian elim elimination, the leading term had the same variable, right? 4x, 7x, or whatever we did earlier. Here, the variables are different. What do we do? We just have to make them the same. Otherwise, there's no way we can eliminate them. How do we make them the same? We do this by multiplying the first polynomial. These are the leading terms, by the way. I've highlighted them in yellow. And we do this by multiplying the first polynomial by x and the second one by y. What is the rationale behind this, behind these multipliers? Well, if we multiply the first polynomial by x, then the leading term becomes x cubed y cubed, right? Because you have x squared y squared times x, which is just x cubed y cubed. And at the same time, in the second polynomial, when you, when you do y times the second polynomial, uh, x cubed y squared becomes x cubed y cubed. Right? So then now the leading terms match uh, after these multiplication. And then of course you just subtract. And um, uh, once we subtract, this eliminates the leading term. Uh, the resulting equation in this case is 4x minus 2y is equal to zero which is equivalent to saying y is equal to 2x. Finally, put y is equal to 2x in the first polynomial. Uh, if you do that, you'll deduce that. Uh, you, it basically simplifies to saying 4x cubed is equal to 4, which means x is equal to 1. And now, since you know that y is equal to 2x, if you put x is equal to 1 there, you get y is equal to 2. Again, the system of polynomials is fully solved. And the only uh, thing that we needed to do was to use um, uh, the same logic as we did in Gaussian elimination. I mean, if you go back to how we started, right? These two polynomials by themselves, it looks a little complicated to solve for x, right? Because you, you know, you can you have to put for x. This actually, this is a pretty simple case as well. But this itself can look pretty awkward. Like you, you'll have if you. Uh, rearrange the first polynomial, you'll get square roots. If you rearrange the second one, you'll get cube roots. It's just a little, it's just a mess. But with this method, it was very clean. And it's uh, the best part of this is it's programmable. It's very easy to do. So that was nice. An idea very sim similar to the core idea of Gaussian elimination worked in the case of a pair of nonlinear equations. Okay. Gaussian and Gaussian elimination can indeed be generalized to work with any system of polynomials. Given polynomials f and g, the polynomial obtained after eliminating the leading terms of f and g, in that case, it was x squared y cubed and x cubed y squared, if I remember all right. Uh, the, the polynomial obtained after eliminating the leading terms of f and g is called the s polynomial of f and g, and it's denoted s Fg. This is this is one uh, notation that it would be good to remember, um, and I'm going to do another example here to make the concept of s polynomial of an s polynomial very clear. We have two polynomials f and g. Uh, the leading term of f is x squared z, okay? and the leading term of g is x y. Remember, we want to make the leading terms the same, so we multiply f by y. And uh, the, when you do that, the leading term becomes x squared yz. And uh, you multiply g by xz. So in that case, the leading term also becomes x squared yz. And when you subtract, this eliminates the leading term of both f and g. Okay. To solve a general system of polynomials, what we have to do is that we need to compute s polynomials of every pair of polynomials that you have in the system. And you do this um, iteratively until the system can be solved just by in the way that we saw earlier. 
So um, uh, we, we need to do this until the system can be uh, solved. And the set of all S polynomials is called a Grobner basis. Okay. Uh, this, is, this is the definition of a Grobner basis. Just like in the case of um, uh, Gaussian elimination, the polynomial system can be solved by a, by simple substitution. One, we have a Grobner basis. And the, the only the, the key computational step is computing S polynomials, which is very similar to what we did in Gaussian elimination. So uh, let me state the process of forming a, a Grobner basis formally as an algorithm. So we have uh, a set of S polynomials, and we want to find a Grobner basis for S. Right? Uh, this algorithm is called the Buberger's algorithm. In fact, uh, Buberger discovered this algorithm in his PhD thesis. Uh, he called it uh, he, he called it a Grobner basis. Grobner was he, hey, he, sorry. Uh, uh, there's a question in the chat. If you could uh, 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 question uh, uh, is, is there some type of starting by order? Yeah, so that's a very very good question. In fact, uh, the, this whole notion of ordering is that itself is a pretty um, detailed thing. Yes, so uh, there are many ways you can do it. Uh, the The thing is that you uh, you should uh, the uh, any order that you repose on polynomials uh, on monomials um, it cannot be arbitrary. Okay, so one thing that uh, you want to do is if you if you say one mol uh, one monomial dominates another one, after mul if you multiply each, both those monomials with with the same monomial, the 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 resulting uh, monomials should follow the same order. So uh, there should be some uh, there should be some method to this. It's, in fact, it's called a, a total order. And by the way, in this order, one should be the lowest um, uh, lowest polynomial. Uh, and yes, but um, uh, it, it, so as as long as as you follow some rules, you can have any sort of order on uh, ordering on monomials. The question specifically says is that do we have some kind of sorting by order on degree? Yes. One particular uh, order that is commonly used is called um, uh, graded lexicographic order. Grading means by degree. So you first sort by degree. And once you have, uh, if you have many monomials of the same degree, like for instance, x squared and y squared are both monomials of the same degree, right? And even xy is a monomial of degree two. So once you have monomials of the same degree, you sort lexicographically among. Them. So that's called the graded lexicographic order. There's something called graded reverse lexicographic order and so on. Uh, but yes, um, uh, you have to be careful when you uh, when, when you define leading them. I, I kind of swept that under the rug and thank you for the question. Okay, all right. Um, Um, yeah, so what are we doing? So we have a set of S polynomials and we want to find a Grobner basis for S. The algorithm is called Buberger's algorithm, like I said. Um, so we want to find a Grobner basis of S. Sorry. S prime will store temporary S polynomials. It is initialized every time to the empty set. Uh, as described before, what we do is we iterate over every pair of distinct uh, polynomials in S. That is the system that we initially began with. We compute S polynomials for each pair and we add it to S prime. Once we are done with all the pairs, we, uh, we add the entire contents of S prime to S and we repeat. We repeat until the system S is easy, easily solvable by simple substitution. Now, again, I'm not being rigorous, um, uh, explicit when I say what when I say what I mean by that. Uh, the, for this, I'll have to go into the notion of um, divisibility of uh, polynomials with a set of polynomials. But uh, for now, I think it's it's good enough to say that. If you have low degree polynomials, if when you when you do uh, when you compute s polynomials and you keep updating your uh, set with these s polynomials, you you want to obtain low degree polynomials okay? because it's low degree polynomials are easier to work with. Like we saw how easy it was to work with linear equations, right? Um, uh, it, so if you have high degree polynomials, you want you want to uh, you you want to obtain. When you do S pairs, you want to obtain low degree polynomials, and then 
once you have enough of them, uh, you, you, you should be able to solve the system. That's, uh, that's the, the thing. But um, I'm not going to get into those specific details, but I think intuitively we know what, uh, we have an idea what, what needs to be done. And when we break out of the loop, we have a Grobner basis. Uh, as I mentioned, the algorithm is really very simple to understand. We know how to compute S polynomials. We keep computing them until necessary. That's all the algorithm. Uh, once again, any questions? All you really need to remember are what S polynomials are. And then, uh, and, the, and then yes, there's nothing very clever that's happening. You do it, you compute S polynomials for every pair of uh, polynomials in your system and you're, you stop at some point, that's it. Okay, so let's step back to conceptually understand what is happening when we do Gaussian elimination or Grobner basis computation, right? Uh, so, I mean, we know what's happening algebraically, we're doing some manipulation, but what's happening geometrically, right? So let's go back to this example where we solved a system of two linear equations and two variables. These are the equations. The zero sets of these two polynomials look like this. Uh, the, I mean, they're color coded to match the polynomial. And the common zero of these two linear polynomials is marked with a big white dot, as you can see. Obviously, that is indeed the point we want to find algebraically. When, I, when we say solve the system, we want to find the point at which both polynomials evaluate to zero, which is basically the intersection of the zero set. Uh, when we eliminated x, we got the equation y is equal to 2, right? We got uh, minus 26 y is equal to minus 52, which is the same as y is equal to 2. Now, what does y is equal to 2, the, uh, the equation y is equal to 2, look like geometrically? Well, y is equal to 2 is a line parallel to the x-axis. And the important thing to note is that it passes through the white dot which is actually the point we want to find. So I'll say this one more point, one, one, once more to drive my point home. When we do Gaussian elimination on a system of linear equation, we are preserving the solutions of the original system, but we are replacing the original set of equations with quote unquote simpler equations. Simpler just means algebraically, and if, if you want to mechanically solve it, it's easier to solve. Uh, and uh, there, there is no cleverness required to solve y is equal to 2, right? y is equal to 2 just means y is equal to 2, which is trivially done. So that's how we are able to solve. And once we know y is equal to 2, uh, two we can mechanically get uh, the value of x. And this is what it means to solve a system, to be able to algorithm, algorithmically solve a system. Okay. Uh, any questions? This, this one should be simple. This, I, I told you that Grobner bases are just a generalization of um, Gaussian elimination, right? Uh, sure enough, the same sort of thing happens geometrically in the case of Grobner bases. Here we start with this system of three polynomials, all nonlinear, obviously. These are what the zero sets look like, quite distinct looking, as you can see. And the common zeros of these three polynomials is again marked with one white dot. Okay, so let's compute the Grobner basis of the system of three polynomials. Basically, as mentioned in the algorithm, you need to do compute all S polynomials for all pairs of polynomials. Uh, I'm gonna skip over doing this computation in, step by step in front of you mechanically. Uh, you can do this for yourself, it's a nice exercise. This, uh, the system is not too difficult. At the same time, it's not too elementary. Uh, elementary, you can so it's a good exercise to try out. Um, so when we do the computation, these are the polynomials that uh, the additional polynomials that come up. These are the additional s pairs, s polynomials that come up in the Grobner basis computation. We get y minus one and x minus two. Okay. So what do the zero sets of the polynomials y minus one and x minus two look like? Well, they look like this. Two lines, one parallel to the x-axis and the other one parallel to the y-axis. Uh, the intersection of these two singularly goes through that white dot, as you can see. 
So what happened? So we replaced this complicated looking uh, system of polynomials with two linear equations. In fact, two very simple linear equations. And then solving that, and uh, this replacement ensured that the common zero sets are preserved. And the solving this new set, this new um, uh, set of equations, which is y minus one and x minus two, was very elementary, right? So, I, I, I mean, so uh, we we were able to mechanically solve them, and we got the solution to the original system of the equation. And this is precisely because the point of intersection was preserved. We don't care about the rest of the points. We just care about the points which are which lie on all three zero sets, and because that's preserved have the right solution for the system uh, for the system of uh, equation is this clear i told you uh, there's a lot of math but it's all very very simple mathematics um, now let us look at uh, some applications of grobner basis um, uh, solving systems of polynomials kinds of uh, polynomials kind of sells itself but let's look at some uh, explicit ways in which one can use Grobner basis. There are many software systems, by the way, which when given a set of polynomials compute Grobner basis. And um, I, I'll, in fact, one of one such, oh, there's a question in chat here. What happens when there isn't a solution? Uh, actually, you'll see that. Um, you'll, um, you'll, in one of the applications, you'll see what happens. Um, uh, you'll yeah we we yeah we'll see what happens in the in the application. That's a good question again. Our first application is in testing. Our first application is in testing if a system of polynomials does indeed have a common zero. Okay, so that was precisely the question that was asked in chat. Uh, so yeah, we have a system of polynomial equations. We want to know if it if they do have a common zero. Uh, how can we use Grobner basis for this? Well, it's very very simple. It turns out that for a system S, S is not solvable if and only if the Grobner basis of S contains a constant polynomial. Okay, a uh, constant polynomial is just a polynomial which contains no indeterminates, no x or y or z or any those kind of terms, just constants. And so if the Grobner basis of S contains a constant polynomial, the system is not solvable. And if the, if the Grobner basis does not contain a constant polynomial, the system is solvable, okay? Geometrically, a system, we know what this is. A geometrically, a system is solvable if, uh, there are, if there are points which lie on the zero sets of all polynomials in the system at the same time, right? The intersection of all the zero sets must be non-empty. Let's look at uh, some examples. Uh, here we have two polynomials, F1 and F2. And this system, I mean, was rigged uh, to be unsolvable. Uh, let's see if our test, this test that we saw, where you, know, you compute the Grobner basis and you check if it contains a constant polynomial. Let's see if the test actually confirms this fact, okay? Uh, this I uh, I did Grobner basis computation on Macaulay and I, I wish I could have shown you uh, I, I could have done the coding live but then my Macaulay was acting up and then uh, I just yeah I just didn't want to do all that uh, it's just easier to just I, I to pre-compute this and then show you the output so here's the out here's uh, the here's the computation uh, GB just uh, gens just stands for generator. GB is Grobner basis. Uh, I, have, I have not defined what an ideal is, but anyway, you know what you're looking at. You're looking at um, the system. Um, uh, you're looking at the polynomial system, which is y minus x plus two and y minus x minus one. And once you ask Macaulay to uh, Macaulay two uh, to give you a Grobner basis of the system, it gives you a constant polynomial one, right? And so this is a constant polynomial. This is not solvable. And of course, um, uh, you can confirm this geometrically. The zero sets of these polynomials don't intersect, they're parallel lines. So uh, Grobner, this Grobner basis test uh, corroborated what uh, we know about these polynomials, right? Uh, let's do another example. Here we have a solvable system. 
uh, let's use the Grobner basis method again. When we compute uh, the Grobner basis, we get the polynomial. So, uh, so again, when we compute the Grobner basis for the system, y minus x plus two y and y plus x. Um, again, you do it on Macaulay and you get y plus one and x minus one as, uh, as uh, elements in your Grobner basis. Uh, neither of them are the constant polynomial. So that means our test says that this system should be solvable. And again, we can see this geometrically. The zero sets of these polynomials indeed intersect. So in other words, the system is solvable. Any questions? No questions? Okay. Right. Let's do another uh, fun example here, which I hope, which I mean, this might be more relatable. It's Sudoku solving. I'm, I'm going to assume you know what Sudoku is. Uh, and I'm going to show, um, I'm going to do an example on a four by four Sudoku. Uh, of course, we can use the same idea for any size Sudoku. So yes, this is a generic four by four Sudoku with variables in place of actual numbers. Right? We know the rules of Sudoku. Each row must contain uh, all numbers from one to four exactly once. Right? This constraint I'm going to model as a polynomial. Yeah? And we, uh, the way I'm modeling is by saying that the sum of these four, um, the, of the numbers in these four cells must add up to 10. Why is it 10? Because one, two, three, four, one plus two plus three plus four uh, is 10. And I do one equation for every row. Now, uh, when, I, when I write it at this level of generality, of course, I'm, uh, this, these could be anything, right? These could be positive numbers, these could be negative, you could have fractional numbers, but um, what will happen is eventually you'll have enough number of constraints to such that, that those kind of solutions to these equations will be ruled out. Anyway, so what we have is we have one equation for each row. Um, and the, the equation just says that uh, the indeterminates of that row must sum up to 10. Okay. And we have in Sudoku, we have the column constraints as well, that every column must have every number from one to four exactly once and that's and those and to model these constraints again we have uh, four equations we have four equations to model these constraints um, as you can see each each column sum must be 10. okay uh, what is the third constraint that uh, we have in uh, sudoku we need that every every two by two block in the sudoku must also contain all numbers from one to four exactly once and here, uh, again, we model these constraints. Uh, in the same way, we say that every two by two, the sum of the indeterminates in every two by two block must be 10. Okay. And we, now we have a total of 12 equations. Uh, what we need is, so, so, uh, so when you're actually given a Sudoku, you'll, you'll be given numbers in a few places and blanks in a few other spaces. So your Sudoku is always pre-filled a little bit. And uh, here in this example, we have uh, these numbers highlighted in yellow that are filled in the Sudoku. Uh, uh, it, it, in this case, uh, so you have, you have these basic numbers, two, four, one, two, one, four, one, three. We have to, we have to uh, incorporate these as well as polynomial constraints. And it's very obvious how this is done. Uh, in the one one location in your Sudoku, we now have two. So the polynomial that we add to a set of constraints is x11 is equal to two. Uh, we have four in the okay, we have four in the one two cell one two cell, so we say x12 is equal to four, and so on. It should be pretty clear, uh, pretty clear how we get these constraints. So now. Once again, you have row constraints, which ensure that uh, that every row contains numbers from one to four. You have column constraints, which ensure that every row, every column has every number from one to four exactly one. And then you have two by two block constraints. And then you also incorporate what information you're already given about your pseudo. To solve this puzzle, all we need to do 
is find a Grobner basis for the entire system of constraints. And once again, we can ask a software to do this for you. The, the output is a little ugly, uh, but yeah, I mean, I just, I, once again, I just copy, uh, copy pasted uh, the output from when I tried it. So again, here you're asking for a Grobner basis of uh, this entire system of polynomials. And the output is, uh, the output is labeled O2 here in uh, this image. And you can see that the, uh, that uh, every uh, every element of the Grobner basis is just a linear polynomial. It's a, it's linear and it has just one variable. I mean, you started with linear, so that's not, having linear in the output is not a, big, a huge surprise, but every, every linear equation is just an equation in one variable. And it's no, everybody knows how to solve those, right? Uh, I, I, and I've, I've highlighted the ones that the new one, the new um, uh, such equations uh, the, that the Grobner basis computation got us in yellow. So, I mean, we already added X minus X, X four, four minus three into our, into the system that we started with. But the new one is, new ones are the ones highlighted in yellow. And sure enough, using that, using uh, those uh, elements in your Grobner basis, you can fill the, the blanks of the Sudoku that you were, uh, that you started with. So X42 minus two, the polynomial X42 minus four minus two, just means that the, the number two must be placed in the four two cell and so on. Okay, so uh, this, so we can solve Sudoku's very easily using Grobner basis computation. In fact, sometimes um, uh, you have uh, Sudoku's which don't have a unique solution, right? Uh, in that case, what, what will happen is, um, I, I mean, in, in, so here in this output, you were able to solve uh, the system uniquely. There was just one solution. You were, you were able to precisely de and deterministically place numbers in every cell. But in some, in some cases, if the Sudoku does not have a unique solution, the Grobner basis will reflect that. You'll be able to find more than one solution by uh, just back substituting, uh, by back substitution and care, careful analysis of uh, the output of the Grobner basis computation. Okay. Uh, any question? Yeah, no, nothing here today is um, uh, really all that difficult to understand. It's uh, just the fact that Gaussian elimination, uh, just small tweak to that. Um, where you, when you com compute S polynomials, that works and is very powerful. And um, you can work that, uh, you can do that on any system of polynomials and these give you answers. Um, uh, these give you critical insight into these polynomials. And that's the message that I'm trying to uh, send here. So I've given two simple applications. Um, in fact, there are numerous applications of Grobner basis, right from very mathematical issues such as solving Diophantine equations, which are basically, uh, these are equations um, where you want solutions to the equations, uh, and but your solutions have to be integers. So that's, uh, that's a very complicated thing in number theory. And uh, so you have such mathematical um, applications right up to applications in paleontology. Uh, in fact, I wanted to uh, do some of those, but that requires setting up a lot of data and everything, so I had to skip that. And in fact, uh, there are conferences dedicated exclusively to collecting applications of Grobner basis. Uh, there are books focused on just this subject. Uh, and, in, yeah, and in general, whenever there is a system of polynomials, which is often, because polynomials are general and you can uh, model many real world situations using polynomials, uh, getting, getting the gro finding the Grobner basis of these systems of polynomials have the power to give you very important insight into the system. It, uh, uh, you'll get, you get critical insight. And these polynomials are basically the simplest polynomials that describe the system. So because of that, you're able to do um, analysis. And there have been numerous improvements to uh, the implementation of Buerger's algorithm because uh, Buerger's algorithm, you're doing, you're doing, uh, you're computing S pairs for every pair of polynomials. And then once you have those S pairs, again, you have to do that. You have to keep doing that until the system is solvable. And that can get very expensive. In fact, it's um, the naive implementation has exponential running time. Uh, but uh, in many cases, there are very clever optimizations you can do and, uh, and um, 
not just not just optimizations if you use some structure in the polynomials right for instance if you know that the polynomials are symmetric um uh, it, it turns out that you can do grobner basis much more efficient and uh, there's a lot of software uh, which computes grobner basis uh, i i uh, just to tell you again the images i've shown today are from macaulay 2 macaulay 2 is a computer algebra uh, software uh, there are many other softwares which will give you this and uh, those are and in fact macaulay 2 is the simplest one um, the other ones they have much more clever uh, optimizations present so they can do it faster and again there's an entire book dedicated to uh, 